Hello, and good day to you all. Welcome to episode 7 of our open online course for Einstein Summation Convention. Today will be the last video of new content, and this will mark the end of the course. We will take everything you learnt in the last two episodes and wrap it all up into one big identity. If you're not too confident with both the Epsilon and the Kronika Delta symbols we dealt with in the past two episodes, I strongly suggest that you have a look at those first. So let's get cracking. We know the Epsilon symbol, a third order tensor, and the Kronika Delta, a second order tensor. What if I were to say that there existed an identity that directly linked them together? This identity, the Delta Epsilon, is as follows. Epsilon, I, J, K, Epsilon, I, L, M, is equal to Delta, J, L, Delta, K, M, minus Delta, J, M, Delta, K, L. The identity is rather complicated, as you can see, but it's important to know. We'll go through some steps to help you understand why this works. Let's raise some questions, first of all. Don't worry, we'll discuss them momentarily. How many components does this identity have? Is this because there are any dummy indices involved? Or are all the indices free indices? Let's take a look at the left-hand side for a moment. What can you see about this side of the identity? Recall the knowledge you gained from earlier on in the course about tensors. We see here that J, K, L, and M are all free indices, as they all appear exactly once in this term of the identity. This leaves I, which appears twice. This means that I is a dummy index. We can then check this with the right-hand side. Only the indices J, K, L, M appear here. They also only appear once per term, so we have four free indices. Because we have four free indices, what does it say about the number of components in this equation? Well, four free indices means we have a fourth order tensor, and as each index has a dimension of three, we have three times three times three times three, which is equal to 81 components. But what does this identity mean, if anything? Let's take another look at the left-hand side. Let's consider epsilon ijk and epsilon ilm as two 3x3 three three matrices, defined by the free indices of each epsilon, keeping i is equal to 1, 2, and 3, as unknown for the moment. So we have a first matrix of epsilon ijk is equal to epsilon i11, epsilon i12, epsilon i13, and so on, and the other one, as epsilon ilm is equal to epsilon i11, epsilon i12, and so on. However, instead of multiplying them through conventional matrix multiplication, we multiply just one element of the first matrix to any one element of the second matrix. There is another way of demonstrating how there are 81 components present. Each matrix has 9 components, and can multiply with any one of the 9 components in the second matrix, or 9 by 9 is equal to 81. By looking at this representation, it might be difficult to see which of these components are zero, and which are non-zero. In some cases, regardless of the value of i, there will be an epsilon with a repeated index in a term of the equation. This is clearly equal to zero. For example, let's consider epsilon i22, epsilon i23, is equal to epsilon 122, epsilon 123, plus epsilon 222, plus epsilon 223, plus epsilon 322, epsilon 323, which is equal to zero, plus zero, plus zero, which is equal to zero. However, many components which share no repeated indices of their free indices also equal zero. For example, epsilon i12, epsilon i23, is equal to epsilon 112, epsilon 123, plus epsilon 212, epsilon 223, plus epsilon 312, epsilon 323. All three of these terms are equal to zero, giving a total of zero. So for what values of j, k, l, and m can the product be non-zero? Let's take the example epsilon i12, epsilon i21, is equal to epsilon 112, epsilon 121, plus epsilon 212, epsilon 221, plus epsilon 312, epsilon 321. This is equal to 0, plus 0, plus 1, times minus 1. So this is equal to minus 1. So, here we have a component that is non-zero. Why is this? We see that j is equal to 1, k is equal to 2, l is equal to 2, and m is equal to 1. It turns out that if j and k equal two different numbers, and l and m equal those two same numbers, then we have a non-zero entry. Why is this? Well, 
If we have more than two different numbers as the three indices, no term of the cross product will have both epsilon with no repeated numbers, as we can see here. If m is equal to 2, the i equals 3 term would have 2 epsilon with no repeated index. Here's another example that satisfies a non-zero component. Epsilon i13, epsilon i13 is equal to epsilon 113, epsilon 113, plus epsilon 213, epsilon 213, plus epsilon 313, epsilon 313. This is equal to 0, plus minus 1 times minus 1, plus 0, which is equal to 1. But now the following question is raised. Why is this example 1? when the previous example is minus 1. Well, let's take a look at j, k, l, and m again. j is equal to 1, k is equal to 3, l is equal to 1, and m is equal to 3. The pattern of how the numbers are distributed has changed. From this, we can summarize that if j is equal to l, k is equal to m, and j is not equal to k, Epsilon ijk, epsilon ilm is equal to 1. And if j is equal to m, k is equal to l, and j is not equal to k, then epsilon ijk, epsilon ilm is equal to minus 1. Otherwise, we have 0. And this is exactly the definition we have on the right-hand side of the identity. Let's take the first term, delta jl, delta km. The first delta has the association between j and l whilst the second delta has the association between k and m. The result of this product is positive, as the Kronecker delta only has positive components. Similarly for the second term, we have associations between j and m, and k and l, but this time the result is negative, as we are subtracting the product. Hopefully, how this identity functions is more clear to you now, and it is important that you understand the reasoning why, to get a proper understanding of both the Kronecker delta and epsilon tensor. For convenience, here is a simple way of remembering this identity. The first index of each epsilon goes to one delta, and the second index goes to the other delta of the first term. Then we minus the first index of one epsilon by the second of the other. Or, more simply, inner inner, outer outer, minus outer inner, inner outer. That's all for this episode, and for the core content of this course. Before we leave you, let's recap what you should have learned in this episode. Can you define the delta epsilon identity? Can you explain why the delta epsilon identity holds? Can you apply the delta epsilon identity to an equation? Before we leave you for this episode, we would like to thank you for sticking with the MOOC alternative throughout the entire course, and we wish you the best of luck if you want to take the exam. However, we do recommend that you have a look at our final episode, the consolidation episode, where we check your knowledge of the delta and epsilon tensors and apply the identity to situations you might come across in the problem sheets and the exam. If you're still unsure about the content in today's video, make sure to check out the usual links to help you out. That's all for now, and thanks for watching.